All right, so it is two o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get our class started. I've been really excited to teach this class for a while. <laughs> this is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. Um, my name is Janice Terry and I work for Weber Basin Water Conservancy District. I am the gardener here. And so we're gonna be talking about herbs today, which is a lot of fun. So um, when it comes to herbs, we're going to be talking about um, some basics on how to grow herbs in general, what an herb is, why we should be growing herbs, common pests, common maintenance issues, stuff like that. And then we're going to get into specific herbs. So we've got quite a few people um, joining us today. So we probably won't have time to stop and answer questions along the way. So if you guys do have a question, please just um, either ask it and then know that we'll try to get to it to the end or at the end. Um, my coworker Dave is on right now and he is going to be answering questions as much as he can as well. So we also have a Facebook Live going on and the Facebook Live video is a little bit delayed. So if you guys are watching through Facebook, just know that um, you're just a little bit delayed. So if you ask a question, you, well, I don't think that you can ask a question on Facebook Live. So go ahead and email Dave and he will let me know what questions you have um, as, as well as he So his email is D as in Dave, <laughs> D Rice as in the food that you eat. So it's D Rice at WeberBasin.com. So, um, like I said, we'll try and get to as many of your questions as you have, and we're just going to go ahead and get started. So the first thing we're going to talk about is our herbs, right? <laughs> what is an herb? And that is correct grammar. It is an herb because the H is silent. It's not herb, it's herb. And so I have five different examples of different plant types here. We've got grasses, bulbs, perennials, um, this nice petunias representing the annual family, and then we have this gorgeous tree. So really, oh, there's my picture. For some reason, I couldn't see myself on my screen and that was throwing me off, but, but which of these are herbs or are any of them herbs? From a botanical point of view, an herb is a plant that does not produce a woody stem and dies back each winter to a perennial root system. So by that definition, annuals are technically not herbs and trees are technically not herbs. And so my background, I have a degree in plant science from Utah State University and I had to take a class called herbaceous plant materials and where, you know, we learned about ornamental grasses and annuals and perennials and house plants and it was so much fun. <laughs> but I tell people, you know, I was like, oh, I've got my herbaceous plant material class at one and they're like, you're in herbs? And I'm like, no, this isn't herbology. It's not Harry Potter. It's Utah State. It's, it's those herbaceous plant materials, the non-woody plant materials in our yard. But from a culinary or uh, ornamental horticulture standpoint, when we talk about herbs, we're talking about plants that serve as a major source of seasoning and food preparation, scents and cosmetics, you know, like potpourri, stuff like that, and plants that are used for medicinal uses. So we have all five of those different types of plants represented here on the screen with herbs that are members of those types of families. So like grass, we have lemongrass. Um, I don't know if you guys knew, but saffron is a plant that you can grow in Utah. It actually does pretty well. Um, and it grows from a bulb and that's going to be our last slide. So stay around, stick around to the end and we're going to I'll teach you guys how to grow saffron in your gardens, which is kind of fun. We have a slew of perennials that are herbs, you know, lavenders and bay, well, bay is a, a tender um, tree actually, as is represented in the tree spot, but we've got sages and all kinds of different perennials that do great in our gardens that we can grow as perennials or that we can grow as herbs. And then there are a whole slew of perennials that we treat as annuals. So we're gonna talk about a bunch of these and it's gonna be a lot of fun. So why should we grow herbs? There are a ton of reasons to grow herbs. Um, I think that herbs are gaining a lot of popularity. People are wanting to do their own, but one reason is that herbs and spices are full of antioxidants. 
Um, so below I have a link to an article that was published by a university, um, a university of Oslo, where they took like over, they took hundreds of different food materials and they compared the amount of oxidants, antioxidants, in each of these types of food per weight. And most of our common herbs and spices were some of the most um, rich when it came to antioxidant um, composition. So, and it really makes sense if you think about it because the reason why these herbs and spices are so flavorful is because they have so many compounds in them. And some of those act as antioxidants in our body. So they're very good for you, right? They're very good. Grow some herbs, sprinkle them on your food and be healthier. And for, for money reasons, right? For financial reasons. So I made some German potato salad the other day and so I needed some fresh dill. So I go into the grocery store and I bought a bunch of dill and it cost me $3. And I was like, that's not bad. You know, it's not terrible. Three bucks is three bucks. And then I was walking into another grocery store a little while later and saw that there was a dill plant that I could have purchased for $3, right? <laughs> so, um, and a dill plant will keep on giving me dill you know, long after my potato salad was finished. So from an economic standpoint, if you're gonna use herbs a lot, it makes a lot of sense to grow your own simply because store-bought herbs are pretty expensive for the amount that you get. Um, growing your own herbs can be more delicious. So this, I have this little sentence that says, such in the case um, of cilantro. So cilantro, some people, you either love it or you really don't like it. I really love it. I think it kind of has a, a bright citrusy flavor that goes well in a lot of different dishes. Um, but a lot of people complain that it has a soapy kind of taste. And that soapy taste is actually accentuated the longer that it's been picked, um, like the longer that it's on, on your shelf or in the fridge, it's going to develop some of those flavors. So it's much better if you can just snip it straight from your garden and put it right into the dish. And a lot of, a lot of herbs, they, they do start losing their flavor almost right after they've been cut. Some of them lose their flavor quicker than others. And the reason for that is simply because um, they just start to break down. They're no longer actively growing, they're oxidi oxidizing, and they're starting to lose some of those compounds that make them so fresh and delicious. So if you can grow your own, you can go straight from your garden with a handful of fresh herbs, whatever they may be, and put them straight into your dish and you're gonna have optimal flavor. And then I guess I should say one other reason is when you grow and process and store your own herbs, um, you know exactly where they've been, right? So I, I, you know, sometimes the internet is a rabbit hole <laughs> and Epicurious makes these videos called cheap versus expensive and they'll have an expert on something and they'll look at two of the same product and tell you which one is the expensive version and which one is the cheap version. And there's a guy that does He's a spice expert, which I love that there are people out there who were just experts on spices. And he was looking at a cheap turmeric versus an expensive turmeric. And he had them in his hand and he was, you know, swishing them around. And he's like, well, this one is clumping, which is good because a lot of cheaper turmerics have all kinds of anti, um, uh, not clotting, what's the word, clumping agents. And this one, you know, these cumin seeds are, have more pronounced ribs, which means they're fresher. And these ones are more worn down. So, oh yeah, the worn down ones have less flavor. The fresher ones have a much brighter flavor. So you don't really know what you're getting in those little bottles that you buy from the store. Um, there is a quality difference depending on what type of brands and stuff you get. And you can do some research to try and figure out which of those are going to be higher quality but if you grow your own then you know exactly you know what type of varieties you have you know what they've been treated with you know how they've been handled how they've been processed after harvest you know all of those things because you've done them yourself and that can you know add a, a quality to your dishes that you maybe wouldn't have otherwise so Hopefully you're all on board. You guys are here, which means you're probably interested in growing herbs. I don't have to get you on the bandwagon. You're already there. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to grow herbs in general, and then we're going to get into some, some specifics with specific herbs. So the first thing you're going to think about um, is your site, 
right? So you've got your garden and you're going to think about where in my gorgeous garden am I going to plant my herbs? And there are some considerations to think about when it comes to selecting a spot for herbs. And the first thing is sun. You want to give your herbs as much sun as you possibly can. And this is for a couple of different reasons. The first one is that the more sun that your herbs get, the the more flavor they're going to have. Um, you can plant some of these herbs in partial sun. So if you have some like dappled areas or areas that are going to get um, less sun, they might survive and look like they're doing okay, but they're not going to taste nearly as strong. You need full sun in order for the oils in the plant to develop properly to give you that flavor profile that you're looking for. Um, so between six and eight hours of full sun is ideal. There are a couple of exceptions um, that we're not really going to to talk too much about so just in general just know that that you want full sun as much as as much as possible uh, the second thing to think about is drainage there are very few plants in general but very few herbs that can handle having what we call wet feet that can handle having their roots in a wet soil all the time. And we're gonna talk about how a lot of herbs wanna be moist, but they don't wanna be wet. And there is a difference. It's like the difference between when you have a sponge and you put it in the water and you pick it up and it's dripping, that's, that's wet, right? Plants don't like that. But if you have your sponge, you, you soak it up and you squeeze the water out, it's moist, but it's not necessarily wet. And that's kind of what we're looking for in soil. We wanna keep it evenly moist. So drainage needs to be able to happen. We don't, we can't have any waterlogged soils. That's gonna be really bad, especially for herbs that are going to be growing from bulbs or that have five or um, like tuberous roots. So things to think about. And so one thing you need to think about is um, compaction, because compaction is one of the main reasons why people have drainage issues. If you have an area that's extremely compacted, or if you are very clay soil, clay is really hard, it has a hard time draining, you might want to look at amending the soil if you can, or consider different types of, of growing um, practices. Like in this example, we've got this gorgeous area where someone has planted their herbs it looks like it's getting full sun there's not a lot of trees around to block it and they have opted for a raised bed situation so if you have a spot that's just perfect and it has terrible drainage maybe consider building some raised beds and planting your herbs in those raised beds and then proximity to the kitchen if you live on a large lot it might be really inconvenient to plant your stuff in the North 40. But if the North 40 is the only place that you have good drainage and full sun, definitely do that. Um, but you're more likely to use your herbs if they're convenient to you. So if you're cooking a dish and you're like, dang it, I forgot to bring in chives. Oh, but you know, it's such a long walk to the back corner of my property, we'll just forget them this time that's a shame. So think about those things. Put your herb garden in a place that's going to be convenient. And then we're going to think about what kind of design we want. So most herbs are very conducive to living happily in containers. So if you have a patio home or you have a, um, like you live in an apartment and all that you have available to you are containers, those are great. So I'm moving at the end of this week, actually, and I'm really excited because I'm moving somewhere that has a really big yard, and I'm so excited to just plant everything. Um, but the last two summers, I've done my herb garden on a patio that has nice southwest facing sun, and it's been very successful. Watering can be an issue, especially in the middle of the summertime. Some of my smaller pots, I literally had to water twice a day and it wasn't, wasn't enough. Um, so think about those things when you're thinking about where, you know, what kind of design you wanna do. And pots can also be a great option if you have, if you don't have room next to your kitchen for an herb garden, Maybe just put some pots with some of your most commonly used herbs in them um, right by your kitchen door or by the back door or the front door, whatever's convenient for you. This other picture that I have are perennial herbs in the flower bed. So lavender is a very common example of this. 
Um, a lot of our perennial herbs can be tucked away into a flower bed and you can use them and they're not really, they don't, they don't technically need their own herbs garden space, but it's kind of fun to have. Um, like in these two examples, we have a very informal herb garden, which I think this is the prettiest garden, right? It looks like we've got some oregano, maybe some majorum, lots of different types of um, lavender, the white lavender in particular has a very sweet, mild flavor. We've got some chives, you know, and kind of an informal, very, very pretty well-kept look. And then on the other side, we have this formal herb garden, which is very reminiscent of traditional herb gardens or kitchen gardens from English gardens. Um, a few years ago, my sisters and I took a little trip to England and we spent a lot of time in the gardens because that's what I love. And we spent a lot of time in nanners because that's what they love. Um, but we saw a lot of these types of gardens and most of them are built directly off of the kitchen area. A lot of them have very formal fills to them and they all seem to have some kind of like small structure or focal point. Like in this image, we have this really cool lollipop tree, but sometimes it'd be a bird bath or a sundial. So really the point is, is that your herb garden can be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to have its own space. You can combine it with other plants. Um, just be aware that, you know, sometimes when you say, there's my herb garden, people might think that everything is edible. So have things maybe clearly marked about what people can and can't eat. Um, but yeah, and you don't even have to put them in the ground if you don't want. Stick them in a, stick them in a pot, make a raised bed. So once you have your, your site picked and you've kind of got an idea of, of what you want to do, there's a couple of things that you should be thinking about when it comes to prepping your site. So soil is going to make a big difference when it comes to really any plant that you plant, whether it's an herb or not. And we always tell people just add organic matter, even if you have good soil, I say just add organic matter because once you have things planted, especially things that are gonna stay there like perennials, trees and shrubs, it's really hard to incorporate organic matter into the soil. And organic matter is just decomposed material that was once living. So decomposed leaves, grass clippings, um, pills from your potatoes and your carrots from your kitchen, those type of things break them down, put them in your, in your garden, and they're going to add a lot, a lot of texture or not texture, but structure to your soil, which is very beneficial. Your plants will thank you. But when it comes to fertilizer, there are a couple of herbs that want a lot of fertilizer, but most of them actually prefer to have a little bit less. We are trying to grow lots of leafy foliage for the most part and but we don't want to encourage just a crazy amount of flushing foliage um when herbs can just take off like that they tend to have less flavor um if they're allowed to to stress just a little bit you don't want to stress them too much because that's going to cause a lot more issues um but if they if they have to work a little bit harder they tend to have those oils in higher concentrations, which has more flavor. So for the most part, like if, if your plants are not supposed to be yellow and they're turning yellow, maybe add some fertilizer, but hopefully you've, you've been able to add enough organic matter to provide the nutrients for those plants. So don't worry too much about the fertilizer. Um, and then break up the top 12 to 18 inches of the soil. That's just enough room for the roots to have a nice fluffy place to, to dig down and, um, be able to grow really well. So that's soil. And then the next thing that we really need to think about is irrigation. So we have quite a few people on this webinar or on this in this class. So I'm not sure where everyone is from, <laughs> but I'm assuming most of you guys are from this area. I'm in Layton, Utah right now. Um, and we do not get any type of crop if we don't irrigate. Irrigation is essential. And we always recommend that you water everything with drip irrigation unless you're watering like a large ground cover area, like lawn, right? Lawn wants to be irrigated with some type of spray head. But for the most part, we recommend that um, your perennial beds, your flower beds, your garden, everything should be irrigated with drip. We live in a very dry area. <laughs> we have to be really cognizant of our, um, our water supply and how much we have available and making sure that we have enough for the future. So we have two different types of drip represented here. 
and these two different images. And the first one is inline drip. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time really talking about irrigation just because it's, there's a lot to it. We teach an irrigation workshop. We usually teach an irrigation workshop. Um, we haven't been able to with the coronavirus going on and it's a very hands-on class. And so it's, it's hard to do online, but we have these two different types of drip. We have an inline drip, which is where you have either a tube or what's called trickle tape, which is like a, a like a softer tube that kind of is, is squished flat. Um, and they, they, go through your beds or in a straight row and they have holes every, you know, 12 to 18 inches. And the idea is they're just going to soak all along wherever you, you put it. <laughs> right. So these are really good for high density plantings. If you have a flower bed, that's going to have a, just a ton of plants in it. This, an inline drip can be the way to go, like make a nice grid and, and, and make sure that all of your plants are getting evenly watered. Or this inline drip, I was talking about the trickle tape, um, is really good for row crops. So if you have an area where you're like, I think I want a ton of basil, I'm going to put some rows in my garden of basil, um, inline drip is a really good option. And then the second type of drip we have is point source, where you have a large tube or pipe poly pipe usually going through your your flower bed or your herb garden and then from the the larger pipe you have little pipes going out to the base of each plant and each of those will have an emitter on it that'll dictate how many gallons per hour are going to flow directly to the base of the plant and by watering with drip we're going to do a couple of things the first thing we're going to do is cut down on weeds which weeds are the bane of a gardener's existence, right? <laughs> we all love gardening. Some of us like weeding, but it, sometimes weeds get a little bit much and you know, they get kind of old kind of fast. So all plants need sunlight, water, and nutrients to survive. Weeds, sometimes it feels like they don't need any of those things and they just grow wherever the heck they want, but they still to some extent need light and water and nutrients to survive. So if we can eliminate one of those things, then we're going to have less germination and less weeds to fight. So if you're not irrigating the, the space between your plants, then it's less likely that weeds are going to grow in those places. Um, it's going to save on water. We're not losing a lot of water to evaporation when we choose to irrigate through drip instead of spray heads. And it's going to minimize the mold which in Utah, we really don't have to worry too much about um, our plants molding just because we have such low humidity, <laughs> which can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. Um, but by not irrigating on the actual top of our plants, we're going to minimize the amount of moisture that just sits on those leaves, which is going to minimize the mold issues that we have. And it also helps minimize the slug issues. So if you have an area of your yard that is just decimated by slugs, think about what time of, of day you're irrigating. Um, it's, it's best to irrigate those areas in the morning instead of at night where it, the moisture is then allowed to just sit for a long period of time. So drip is best if you can. Um, and now we're going to talk about planting. So seeds uh, and transplants are the two ways that we're going to consider when it comes to planting our perennials. And did I use this class as an excuse to buy myself way more herbs than I needed? Yes, I did. Do I regret it? No. Does my budget? <laughs> Absolutely. So we have different ways to trans or to grow herbs. We have transplants like I have here in my hand. I've got some sweet marjoram or majorum, depends on where you live, or we can do it through seeds. And the determining factor between what we want to do really depends on how long it takes the plant to germinate for one, and also how long it takes the plant to grow for another. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But when you look at a, a packet of seeds, and I've got some examples here on the next page, it, as is pointed out by these black arrows, um, they should say how many days it takes for the plant to reach what we call maturity, which is just when it's starting to put on seed. And so the longer it takes for your plant to reach maturity, um, the less of a harvest you're gonna get on the latter half of the summertime. So for vegetables, a lot of 
like large tomatoes will say, you know, days to maturity is between like 90 or 120 or something like that, which means it's going to take three to four months for that tomato to start producing or for that tomato plant to start producing tomatoes, um, which means that that's three or four months out of your summer. And in Utah, in this area of Utah, in Layton, um, we typically only have about 160 to 170 frost-free days. So if we can get transplants that already have a couple of, of weeks head start, we can minus those days from the days to maturity, which means we're just going to get a harvest quicker. And I do have, and I'm going to post all these slides online as soon as I can. So on this slide, I've got this link that says at the bottom below the transplant picture that says climate.usu.edu reports freeze dates. If you click on that, it'll bring up a bunch of different areas in the state. Uh, like a lot of cities have their own little tab and it'll take you to the average last frost date which in our area is about May 11th and the average first frost date and the number of days in between is is the growing period that we have to grow our plants um, so for the most part a lot of seeds or um, let's see I, I bought so many herbs I can't find the one that I need so a lot of really quick growing herbs do great being grown from seed um, but a lot of the slower growing ones like like I have chives here chives grow so fast um, they have a very short time between when you plant them to when you can start harvesting them so growing chives from seeds is a great idea it's gonna save you money you can get a lot of chive seeds out of one packet of of seeds, or you can get a lot of chive plants from one packet of chive seeds. Where other things, like I've got a little lavender plant here, um, for the most part, a lot of these woody type herbs need to be grown from cuttings um, because it takes so long for like a lavender or a rosemary um, to, to grow from an actual seed. It just takes too long. So in order to, sh to have as much harvest time as possible, it's better to just buy the plant instead of trying to grow it from seed. But growing from seed, that's kind of fun. You know, you can start growing them as early as February, get them in a nice warm place with plenty of light and, and you can have a plant that is ready to go in the garden with a month or so shaved off of, of those days to maturity so that you can get harvesting as soon as possible. So lots of fun things, lots of fun things to think about. Um, so when it comes to maintaining our herb garden, weeding is absolutely essential. And we already talked about how by irrigating with drip, we're gonna cut down on a lot of the weeding issues that we're gonna have. Um, another thing you can do is add mulch, which that's gonna greatly reduce, greatly reduce the amount of weeds that you're gonna have. Um, you can also put down cardboard or newspaper, that's matte, like just a brown cardboard works great. You can put those around. Um, they will keep the weeds down as well. The thing about weeding is it's actually, from my experience, and I work in a garden every day, all day, um, if you can just stay on top of it, it's not that big of a deal. You know, so we have a large learning garden here, and I might visit an area once a week that I've already, you know, done all the spring cleanup and got rid of the majority of, of the weeds. And it'll just take me a couple minutes to just go through and get all of the new weeds. Um, but when I'm trying to get on top of weeds, it is just not that fun because there's a ton of them and it takes forever, ever to get on top of them. So just stay on top of the weeds. Most perennials do not outcompete weeds very well. Most of them are not native to our area. Um, they have you know, very specific needs when it comes to water and light. So if their water and light is being disrupted from weeds, it's going to be an issue. Um, the second maintenance is to keep, maintenance point is to keep our herbs evenly moist. So like I was talking about before, most of our herbs do not like to have wet roots, but most of them don't really like to have dry roots either. Some herbs that we're going to talk about are native to like the Mediterranean where it, it is kind of drier and hotter and, and some of those can handle having drier 
conditions like rosemary or lavender those are totally happy to be in a dry location so if you have an area of your yard where you're like oh i'd, I'd love to put some herbs in but it's just so hot up against the south facing wall or something those type of herbs would do awesome um but mo a lot of them especially those that are native to like asian countries or latin america um, they prefer to have wetter roots not wetter moister moist more more moist they want to be damp um the third maintenance thing we're going to talk about is deadheading and pinching back so when you're growing herbs for foliage you want to keep those seed heads off you know by by trimming back the seed heads you're going to stimulate more growth um, the plants ultimate goal is to reproduce so it's going to put as much of its energy as it can into growing seeds so if you can if you clip those seed heads off it's going to force the plant to put more energy into growing roots and leaves which is what we want to have happen so keep those those heads off um, there are a lot of herbs that we can grow um, for their seeds like coriander is the seed that's grown on the cilantro plant or cumin seeds are kind of fun to grow. Dill grows a really good seed. Um, you can even grow mustard seed, which is kind of fun. Um, so those ones you would want to encourage the flowers to happen. So to do that, you just, you just let the plant kind of do its thing. Um, and then pinching back is really important. So like I said, I've got plenty of herbs here to talk about. So this is a marjoram plant. Um, this is not typically what I would look for in a marjoram plant if I, was buying it from the nursery, but this is the best one that they had. Um, this is an oregano, their cousins. Th this is more what we want to see. We want it to be short and stocky and dark green instead of long and leggy, and you can see the color difference. This this oregano plant is much has a much deeper green hue than this marjoram plant does. But that's not to say that this marjoram plant isn't going to do well. It's just you know. It's just a little leggy. So one thing I can do to help this plant bush out instead of grow up is I can I can pinch it back, which pinching back is just gonna it's gonna inhibit the the top growth and it's gonna encourage more lateral lateral growth. So when we do that, like we've got this little stock here of marjoram, we're just gonna go back to a growing point. And we're gonna talk a little bit about harvesting herbs and how you harvest the different types. Um, well, depending on, on what you want to harvest, but when it comes to harvesting foliage with a, an annual herb like this marjoram, you can take it back almost to the ground. Um, with perennials, you want to be a little more careful, but really for this plant, I could go back and pinch off a good stock, right? And then I'll take this obviously and use it in my kitchen. Um, and then that little stock that I pruned off is going gonna, is gonna to grow more bushy instead of growing long and lanky. So it's, it's a good thing to do um, to just encourage more growth. So for the most part, there aren't a ton of pests that are gonna take out your herbs. And the reason for that, the reason these herbs have such distinct flavors is because they're actually producing them to, as defense mechanisms. So most, most of them you won't have that big of an issue with. If your plant is, in its prime condition. If it's getting plenty of sunlight, it's it's moist, but it's not wet. Um, if if it has plenty of air movement, um, you're gonna have very few pests that are gonna be an issue. From my experience, and I've had an herb garden for the last 12 years, um, probably longer than that, but I sometimes have issues with grasshoppers on my basil, which makes me so mad because basil is my favorite herb of all time and nothing makes me madder than one day it looks gorgeous and the next day it's full of holes and there's all kind of grasshopper poop on the leaves. So maddening. <laughs> um, but for the most part, if you do have pests, the best thing to do is find a really non-harmful organic way to deal with them. So with some of the larger pests like grasshoppers or um, there are some caterpillars that can do a lot of damage. Baits are a little bit better and then if you have like aphids or once in a while um, if your plant is really drought stressed sometimes um, oh I just lost what they're called mites. Spider mites can become an issue. Um, find some kind of insecticidal soap 
I, I really shy away from putting any type of chemical, harmful chemical on plants where I actually eat, eat the leaf. Um, so that's, that's just something to think about though. There are lots of options and if you are really careful, then, then you're probably fine. Um, but that, those are just things to think about. So we're gonna just talk a little bit about harvesting and we're gonna talk about harvesting leaves, seeds, roots, and flowers. And hopefully you guys will be just as happy as the guy in this picture harvesting that little bucket full of, of lavender. Um, so let's just get right into it. So when you're harvesting leaves, and I would say the majority of the herbs that you're gonna grow, you're gonna be focusing on those leaves, right? So I've got a bunch of examples and really of all of them, leaves are what I are what I'm going to be focusing on. Um, there are a couple of, of herbs, like I said, that we we're going to focus on the seeds, um, coriander, cumin, um, mustard, dill. Um, there are some that you're going to focus on the roots. Those are like your, you can grow ginger and turmeric, some medicinal herbs, you focus on the roots as well. And then some you're going to, want to harvest the flowers. Um, really the only ones I can think of off the top of my head are like borage, which you don't really, they're just an edible flower used for decoration or roses sometimes are used in teas or um, chamomile. You drink the, you infuse the, the dried flower head in water and drink it as a tea. Um, but when it comes to leaves, so this is, this slide is if you're harvesting because you're ready to put them up. For the season right you're going to dry them you're going to freeze them the best time to pick leaves for that is in the early morning right after the dew has dried and that's just because your goal when it comes to drying is to dry the herbs as fast as possible because you want to stop the oxidation from happening you want to stop the plants from breaking down all of those good um things in them that give them the flavor so, as quickly as possible so if you have wet leaves, it's just gonna take longer to dry the plants. So you don't want them to have dew on it and early morning is best because it's the plants are gonna remain firm or turgid is the term that we use, which just means not floppy. Um, they're gonna remain turgid longer when, when they're cool. So, you know, if you don't water a plant for a while and it droops down, that's, it's lost its turgidity. So we want a lot of turgidity in our plants. And so we do that by harvesting when it's, when it's cool. And then you want to harvest when the oils are at their peak. Like I said, the flavor comes from these herbs, comes from the oils that are contained in the leaves. And it depends on the herb is is you know when when the when the oils are at their peak or whatever so for the most part though it's right before they put on seed heads so you should be able to see seed heads starting to form but before they've really started to even have color or anything that for the most part is when it's best to harvest the actual leaves to put them up that's when they're going to have the most flavor um, for the most part with leaves, you can dry or freeze them. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then, like I said before, with annuals, you can cut them down to almost ground level. Just maybe leave a little bit, a few sets of leaves, but for the most part, you can cut them way back and they're not going to have an issue. With perennials, like we've got lavender, I've got a rosemary here, very similar looking, or a thyme, you want to only take off a half of the plant at a time. So otherwise you're gonna stress it too much. So just kind of watch and don't take off more than a half of the plant when you're harvesting. So seeds, for the most part, you wanna to wait to harvest your seeds until the flower heads have turned brown and the leaves of the actual plant are starting to yellow to an extent, unless it's like a, a plant that just keeps on putting on, on flower heads. So, um, but at least wait until the flower heads have turn brown. And then you're going to want to dry the flower heads for five to six days. Then you remove the seeds from whatever, you know, like the flower head that they're on and then dry for an additional week before you put them away. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have much more to say about that. Um, one thing on drying, so we're going to talk a little bit about it. I'll have some pictures, but you can either lay them flat or some people that like to hang their, um, their herbs upside down. We'll put like the the dill flower head when they're trying to collect the seeds in an actual paper bag and let them hang upside down in a paper bag. 
so when it comes to roots and they're really aren't a ton of, of herbs that we focus on the roots. But if you're gonna be adventurous and try growing ginger and turmeric with me this year, cause that's two of my big goals in my garden, I'm gonna try them and it's gonna be fun. Um, you're gonna to wanna to wait until right before the frost to harvest. Um, and you can even like throw ginger, or oh, I said ginger, but you could throw garlic in with the spices if you want. Um, but garlic for the most part, you plant in the fall and then harvest in the spring where if it's a annual type crop that you're focusing on the roots, you're gonna plant them in the spring and then harvest in the fall right before the first frost. And then you wanna wash before storage. And then if you're gonna dry them, cut them thin and make sure that they're completely dry before you try to ground them or save them. Like for any of these herbs, when you're drying them, you want them, like when you, you want them to, there to be like a, a, like a snap or like a crisp, like when you crush the plant, you don't want any type of elasticity left. If there is, that means that you have not dried them enough. So if you're focusing on flowers, like leaves, you wanna harvest them in the cool morning after the dew has dried for the exact same reasons. Um, but you wanna harvest when the buds are just beginning to open for the most part. That's for like chamomile and rosemary. So this little picture I have, these are borage flowers. And borage is, is one of those plants that the plant itself is like, meh, I don't know. It's really big. It takes up a lot of room. And, and the leaves are mostly used in salads. The young leaves are used in salads. There's, it's not like a fantastic flavor. It's just kind of a salad flavor. So nobody grows it. But if most people, if they're growing, growing borage, it's for either medicinal properties or it's for the flowers. You can candy them um, and then put them on like a cupcake which I don't think people really do that much anymore, but it's kind of fun to have edible flowers um, in your garden that you can use to garnish a plate or add to a salad to add a pop of color. And borage is so blue that it adds, adds some fun aesthetics to a plant or to a dish. So when it comes to drying, it should only take three to four days. If it's taking weeks, something is off. And like I said, it, it's just because you want to stop down the breakdown process that starts as soon as you cut a plant from or cut leaves and stuff from the actual plant so you want it to be relatively warm 70 to 90 degrees is ideal and you want it to want there to be very low humidity so in other places in the country where humidity is a thing right <laughs> um a lot of the times they have to put their cut herbs right next to their air conditioning to just try and keep it as dry as possible. But in Utah, we don't really have a lot of humidity, so we don't have to really worry about, about it too much. Um, I would avoid bunching too many flowers or too many leaves together just because that's going to decrease the amount of airflow that can get to the leaves and is going to increase the drying time. So it, a lot of plants, a lot of people, I mean, <laughs> people plants we're all basically the same right we all have feelings um, but a lot of people like to use dehydrators instead of air drying their herbs which works great dehydrators are perfect you can dehydrate um leaves in a matter of hours instead of days um, so you can get your harvest done in, in a quick period of time so dehydrators are kind of fun. And then you can dehydrate all kinds of stuff like fruits and, and vegetables even and keep all of your stuff in storage so you can use your, um, your garden produce and herbs and spices all throughout the year instead of just when they're on. So that's kind of fun. Um, one thing to think about is that plants that have a larger leaf like basil or some of our sages, some of our mints, they really like to, to, to be stripped off and then laid flat on either a mesh screen that has like cheesecloth on it or um, dehydrator screens work just fine um, just to help them dry as quickly as possible. You can use ovens, um, but I would just be a little bit wary because heat is going to break down. It's going to denature the plant compounds faster than almost anything else. Heat and light. So when it comes to storing herbs, you want to keep them away from heat and light as well because that's going to encourage breakdown. But smaller leaves, like I've got 
this time here, it's kind of got woody stalks and then these little tiny leaves, they dry so fast. So there's really no need to try and strip the leaves off of the fresh plant. Let them dry right on their stalk and then just crumble them off onto um, a pan or a sheet of paper, then put them in some glass storage jars for the winter time. So when it comes to storing, we want to, I've got these three different images. Um, you can store your dried herbs in airtight containers for two to three years, depending on the herbs, and it depends on what resource you're reading. Um, I've seen some people recommend that you don't keep herbs for more than one year, but I feel like that's, you can keep them for longer than one year, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say longer than three years. Um, even though the breakdown process really slows down once herbs are dried, the, it's still happening. It's just happening a lot, lot slower and you're going to start losing flavor and the integrity of the, the herbs and spices, the longer that they're on the shelf. So use them up as soon as you can. Um, you can, they're going to last longer as well. And their flavor is going to be more potent if you can store them in opaque containers. So I don't know if you guys have ever been to the store and seen like, um, paprika should be stored in a uh, airtight opaque container. Like the paprika, the brand that I really like to use is in a, is in a tin can because the light is going to break down the compounds that maintain the flavor as well as the color quicker than, than the glass containers. If you use it like crazy though, and the light won't have enough time to ruin the color, break down the flavor, like glass is perfectly fine. Or if you're storing these in like a cupboard that's dark or um, like a storeroom that's dark most of the time, then you really don't have to worry about opaque containers. Freezing can be a great option when it comes to storing herbs. Um, blanching them for about a minute. So you get your water boiling, put your herbs in for about a minute, and then you put them straight into an ice bath to stop the stop the cooking, um, cool it down really quickly, pat them as dry as possible, and then you can either pack them into ice cube trays and then add a little bit of water to just get rid of the air because air is what causes oxidation and it's going to cause the flavor to get funky a little bit faster. Um, or you can, if you're going to use the herbs quicker, then you can lay them after blanching flat on a tray, put them in the freezer. They're going to freeze pretty quickly. Then you can just put them in an airtight container or a, a sealed bag and they last for um, a few months. I, I'd say you probably don't want to keep herbs in the freezer longer than six because then they start to taste like the freezer and, and that's not really what you want. But there are a couple of herbs like dill and um, chives and basil that don't need to be blanched and what blanching does is it just it helps it keep its color and its flavor better than if you just stuck herbs straight into the freezer another fun thing to do is you can infuse oils with herbs so currently i have some rosemary um oil in my cupboard and i use it just to saute vegetables and it's so good. It is so good. It adds a dimension of flavor that wouldn't be there otherwise. And so to do that, so the reason I did it is I, I happened to just have some rosemary and it sat in my fridge for a couple of days. And I was like, oh man, I don't have time to cook anything with this. What can I do? Because I don't want to throw it away because I bought it, right? I bought it from the grocery store. And so I threw it in a pan. I got some oil warm in a pan and then kind of toasted the rosemary around in it for a bit. And, and now the oil has a very distinct rosemary flavor. Um, you can also do it the cold method where you just steep fresh herbs in the oil for a period of time. And that'll depend on the type of herb and how like pungent the flavor is. And then you can keep them for as long as the oil would be good for. Like oil does go rancid over time, but you don't have to worry about keeping them in the fridge or anything. And they can just go straight in the cupboard. And then you can put those oils directly into your dishes, which is kind of fun. And then you're going to channel your inner Gordon Ramsay and make some amazing food. So the list, we're going to go through some specifics now of specific herbs and you're going to assume that all of these herbs want to be grown how we've already talked about. Full sun, moist but not wet, good drainage, not a lot of fertilizer, pinching back, deadheading. You're going to assume that all these want that to happen to them unless we specify otherwise. So there are 
hundreds of fun herbs that we could be talking about, but there are, there's a limited amount of time, right? We've already been going for 50 minutes and, um, I had to really cut down my list of herbs. So when I was like, Oh, which one should I leave off? Which one should I use? I used Gordon Ramsay's list of essential herbs and spices. So that's what we're going to be talking about, as well as some of my favorites and just some fun ones. So the first one that we're going to talk about is parsley. Parsley is easy peasy pretty much to grow. Um, you're going to want to grow it. It's a, it, so it's a hardy biennial, which means that it has a two-year life cycle. Um, it's going to grow from a crown. So a lot of people are like, oh, no, my, my parsley came back this year. Like, yeah, I don't need to buy parsley again. So the first year that it's growing, parsley is going to taste and look amazing. The second year, it's going to, all it wants to do is it wants to go to seed and you're not going to get a good flavor off of second year parsley. So treat it like an annual, just re redo it every year. Um, there are two different types of parsley. You've got the curled, which is a much denser texture so it, it does hold its its um what's the word its structure better like in a soup or a stew uh, but the flavor of the flat leaf parsley is is a lot better so i have both images the top image is of the um the the curly leaf parsley which is mostly used for garnish because the flavor is it's okay it's there but if you're gonna if you're using parsley for the flavor you want that flat leaf which is that middle picture um let's see it seeds have a difficult time germinating so this is one that you might want to consider just purchasing as a as a little transplant the one issue with purchasing it as a transplant though is that we just use it so much that sometimes I'm like, well, it's kind of expensive to buy a lot of transplants. So I've grown it from seed before. Just know that it does have a hard time germinating. So if you soak the seeds overnight before you put them in the soil, that's going to, that's going to help. Um, but they're just, they're, they can be kind of tricky. So if you get a package of partially seed and you plant it out and it has a hard time, it's not you, you are a good gardener. It's the parsley itself. Um, some interesting thing about parsley is that it originated in the Mediterranean area and was spread with the Roman rule, and it has lots of taboo around it, which include, so according to, so it was introduced into England when the Romans were conquering that area of the world, and they thought that it was unlucky to transplant parsley from one garden to another, so... That's bad, and bad luck will prevail if you transplant the herb within your garden. So once you transplant it, don't move it, or bad you do to you. Or this one was my favorite. Someone in a house that parsley was planted near would die shortly thereafter. So if you have some enemies and you're thinking to your, just kidding, we don't ever want to plant parsley with bad intentions. We just plant parsley because it's delicious. Um, basil, like I said, basil is my favorite herb. I sometimes just eat it fresh in a salad. I love it. It's sweet. It's kind of got like an anise, um, AKA licorice flavor, but it's very mild and licorice -y. Very strong flavor though. So good. If there's one herb, grow a basil. And basil does okay being grown inside as well. So if you're really strapped on space and you're like, oh, I, I've got a window. What can I, what can I grow? Parsley does okay. Basil does okay. Um, some other things, not so much, but they, they do okay. It is an annual in our area. You can grow it from either seed or transplant fairly well. Um, it, it's going to grow relatively quickly. It really likes the warm soil though. So if you plant it out on May 11th, which is our average last frost in this area, it's going to take it a minute to get going. So you're going to be like, whoa, look at that little stunted basil. That's not doing anything. It's not you. You're a good gardener. It's the weather. So um, you're, you can start harvesting after six to eight leaves. And it doesn't, I don't want it to say six to eight leaves. I apologize. That's a typo. It wants to say six or eight um, pairs of leaves. So with basil, you can see, or maybe you can't, I'll try and get close, that the, the leaves are what we call, I'll just pinch this off, maybe. They're alternate on the stem, right? 
So that's one set of leaves, two sets of leaves. Um, so you can start harvesting when they have about six leaves. So three sets. That's what I wanted it to say. I apologize. You can start harvesting when there are six to eight leaves, three to four sets. That was confusing. Hopefully that cleared things up. Um, a lot of people think that it originated in Italy because it is one of the um, most popular herbs in Italy. Um, this particular variety is called Genoa, which is the most common large leaf variety of basil. Um, and it's named that from the Genoa region of Italy, but it's actually native to India, which, I happen to have some Indian basil. So um, this is called Tulsi. This is the original type of basil that originated in India. And it's actually considered holy to the Hindus. Um, they believe it's where the plant embodiment of where heaven and earth meet. So that's kind of fun. I spent a couple of, I, I've spent a bit of time in India and I was surprised because, you know, I, I'm, from I, I you know grew up here in Utah I don't get out very much but how many people have this in their home and it's just a part of their religious practice and they have it it's revered to them so that's kind of fun kind of a fun fun fact I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with this because I'm not a Hindu but um, I'll plant it and I'll I'll think about how cool it is every time I look at it. So, but like I said, one of my favorite herbs, so stinking delicious. And there's a lot of cool varieties. So the, the middle, so I've got three pictures here on this slide, this purple variety and the Genoa on the bottom. And the middle one is the Thai basil. So if you're into Asian cooking at all, Thai basil has a very distinct, sharp flavor that's different from the rest of the basil plants. Um, it's not quite as sweet, but it goes so good in curries. So I highly recommend it. Very good, very good plant. Thyme. Thyme is one of my favorite perennials as well as one of my favorite herbs. Um, it's a woody perennial, so it, it has woody stalks and these little simple leaves. It's a good, solid, easy to grow herb. It's very mild flavored, so it's hard to mess up a dish. It, it's like, a, it's just a good old boy. I was, I like love this plant so much that I, I wanted something cool to say about it, right? Like give me some parsley type scandal or, or something, but you know, the internet, every resource I looked at, they were like, no, no, uh, time's, time's a good, it's a good herb. It, it's a good herb. It, it's good to grow. It's easy to grow. It's a very good beginner herb. Um, and I was like, oh, so boring, but it's, it's very good because some, some stronger plants like oregano or basil, you know, if you put it in the wrong dish, it could potentially ruin the dish because they could cause it to be kind of funky, but, but thyme is, it's such a good herby, like umami type flavor that's mild enough that you can kind of throw it in everything to add a, a good note of flavor without really overdoing a dish. So rosemary is fun. Rosemary is right here. Um, so it's a, it's a woody semi-tender perennial, depending on which one you purchase. So it's very good. This one you're gonna to wanna to start from cuttings just because it is a very woody plant. So it takes forever to grow from seed. Um, it does good paired with fruits. It sounds so weird, but I love this with watermelon or strawberries. Sounds so weird because it's got kind of like a, like a rich dull note of like pininess to it. And oh, it's so delicious and it pairs so good with fruit. So you're gonna just trust me and give it a try. Um, but one interesting fact I found about it was it, it was in the cologne that Napoleon used. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that was so funny. I just feel like if I saw, if I met a guy and I was like, ooh, he smells like barbecue. I don't know if I'd find that like a good quality or a bad quality, but that's that's history man who am i to to question it so mints are a lot of fun i think mints are are just so cool so i have two different types of mints here um they are for the most part in our area they are perennials um just a, a note when a, a recipe calls for mint unless it specifies otherwise it's calling for spearmint so so good <laughs> so if you are strapped for room in your garden, so we're gonna talk about all these different perennials. There are a ton of different 
cultivars or a ton of different types of each herb. If you are strapped for room, I would suggest that you just go with whatever the straight most common variety is. Um, Cause like mint's a great example. So if you are cooking something and it says you need mint and you're like, I have mint, but I only have chocolate mint. It, that could cause your veal dish that you're cooking or your, your lamb pasta to be kind of funky if there's a chocolate note in it. Right? So mints come in hundreds of different varieties. There's like I said, chocolate mint, there's orange mint, apple mint, um, you name it, they've probably thought of it. This is a Corsican mint plant. And this one is really cool because it is a very, very dense. Oh, so good. I wish you guys could just smell it. But, um, but yeah, so this is Corsican mint. It's used as a ground cover and as a lawn replacement. So if you're like, I, lawn is just wasting space in my yard. Maybe plant some Corsican mint there. This is the mint that is used to make creme de menthe, which is a, a drink mixer. So that's kind of a, a fun thing. Little factoid as well. Um, but mints are kind of fun. You can pair them with a lot of different things. My favorite thing to do is mix it with um, lime and lemon and drink it like a minty lemonade. And I don't know if you guys have been to Cafe Rio, but they've got that like exactly what I'm talking about. It's like a minty lemonade going. It's kind of a green drink and sometimes at least get stuck in your teeth. It's so good. So you could go to Cafe Rio and get it or you can grow your own mint and make it at your own home. So cilantro or coriander, I did not buy a plant because I'm going to grow them from weeds or weeds. I'm going to grow them from seeds. So it is an annual, um, it is a two for one special because you're going to have the cilantro flower as well as the coriander um, uh, seed, which you can dry and then use in dishes. It's a very, it's a very common spice used in, in both Latin American and Indian and Asian cooking. So it's kind of a, a good one to have on hand. Um, so this is a freaking finicky herb though, because all it wants to do is bolt, which bolting is the term that we use for when things want to put off seed. And when it bolts, the rest of the plant is done. After it sets seed, it is not going to have good foliage for you to use in your, in your salsa after that. So it's kind of tricky because it's going to bolt because it's just going to hit a, a certain spot in its life cycle. When the plant gets so old, it's like, well, I'm a mature adult now. I'm going to set up seed. And then it's going to want to bolt when it gets hot. So you have this kind of shorter and it can't handle frost. So you kind of have this short window between end of frost and when it gets hot and then when it starts to cool down and the next frost. Um, some ways that you can mitigate that is this variety that I have right here is a slow bolt variety. They've been breeding them to try and find plants that can handle a little bit more heat and not want to bolt quite as quickly. Um, and then you can also help avoid that by planting, do succession planting. So like plant some and then the next two weeks plant more and then the next two weeks plant a few more of these coriander seeds to get cilantro. Um, if, you, if you're going for the seed though, if you want the coriander portion of the plant, let it bolt. Just, you know, maybe it's a good idea to enjoy fresh coriander during the cool parts of our growing season and then focus on getting the, or enjoy, yeah, cilantro the, during the cool parts of our growing season and then focus on growing coriander or the seed during the hot part of the year. Um, <clears throat> this I thought was interesting is that the Egyptians believed that the coriander seed could be used as food in the afterlife. So they found it in Egyptian tombs, which is very interesting, right? So I just, I, I like it when plants have like a story. Like, I think that's the coolest thing. Like this is off topic a little bit, but when I talked about my sisters and I going to England and there was one garden that was attached to this gorgeous castle that was a total like poison garden and every poison in that garden had some kind of story to it and it was like you know this is the poison that was used to kill this famous person and this poison was used in this Shakespeare play to kill this character and so it was just kind of fun to walk through and so I love it when plants have a story and I think herbs they're 
you know, for the most part, they're pretty ancient and in that a lot of them have been used for generations and generations. And so there are weird taboo around them and there's weird, you know, I don't know, just like, like Napoleon using rosemary for a cologne. Weird, right? But every time I, you know, hang out with my rosemary plants, I kind of think that there's something special about it. So anyways, that's a side tangent. So chives, chives are really good. They are a cool season perennial. And this is just a little gift that keeps on giving. So I was so mad at myself because I went to the store and bought a bunch of chives. They were pretty cheap, $1.50. So I should probably get over it. But I literally got home and looked out my back door onto the patio and saw that out of one of my containers, my chives from last year are already blooming. I spent $1.50 for a, an herb that I already had at home. So chives are really cool. Use your own chives. Don't be a trader and go buy store-bought chives. Um, these are really fun because they're basically like having an onion without the really intense oniony onionness, if you know what I'm talking about. So it's the same great taste, just a lot milder. So it's great as a garnish because it's almost like having raw onion without having the bite. You all know that what I'm talking about when you put like raw red onion on something and the flavor is so good, but you do, it's kind of like, some of us don't like to bite down on the raw red onion piece. We just want kind of like the essence of the onion here we go. Essence of onion. There you go. You're welcome. So um, Bon Appetit magazine, which is one of my favorite sources for fun recipes and stuff. They have a really good online presence as well as a really fun YouTube channel. So I'm going to just put a little plug out there said that they had an article that said you should be using more chives on everything. And this is what they said. The author said, I want much more than, um, teeny tiny sprinkles. Give me chives by the handful, not the pinch. So I don't know, Bon Appetit magazine, they've been around for a while. They probably know what they're talking about. So maybe you should join this author and put chives on everything. Um, rumored that Marco Polo um, introduced them to Europe from Asia, which that's kind of a cool little tidbit about its origins. And then something to, to be aware of though, when it comes to herbs, the more tender the flavor, the quicker it's broken down through the cooking process for the most part. So like with chives, you can use them in the actual cooking process. Like you can throw them in a dish and saute them or you can put them in bread or, you know, if you're going for like a really seasoned biscuit, but just know that the flavor is really gonna break down really fast. So for the most part in dishes, that's why it's used mostly as a garnish because you get that oniony flavor, um, but you add it at the end of the dishes. So like we're gonna talk about marjoram, that's another one, very tender, like light flavor that you usually add at the end um, of your cooking process. So oregano is a lot of fun. Oregano is a freaking invasive perennial as well. So my first herb garden that I planted, I did it when I was like, I don't know, I, I bet I was like 12. I was pretty young and I've loved cooking my whole life. And so um, I asked my mom if I could take out a, a portion of our back lawn. So I've talked about this before in other classes, but my parents, their yard, and my mom loved gardening. We have the most gorgeous garden, but it's like a one acre long lot and it's very, very narrow and very, very long. So I asked her if I could take out a piece of the lawn out back um, and she said, sure. And so I, I pulled up a, a patch of grass put in the very middle of the lawn, I should say. My dad hated trying to mow around it. Um, and I planted a couple of perennials and my first experience with herb gardening, gardening was not the most successful. Um, I had a lot of things like parsley and chives, um, but that section of our property only got irrigated once every seven and a half days because that's how often Willard's water shares came around. And so most everything died except for my oregano. And to this day, so I am turning 30 in two months. So 18 years later, um, there is still oregano in that lawn that when you mow over that, that patch, you can smell it. It kind of like hits you and you're like, ooh, there's Genesis oregano, right? So it, it is pretty invasive. And so I should have brought this up with the mint plants. The mint and the oregano's, I would never plant these directly into the soil. 
they will take over the area that you plant them in and you're going to have a hard time getting rid of them. Like they are hardy as heck. So these are ones that I would say for containers or sometimes people will plant them in a container and then plant them in the ground if they want that look. Um, but 18 years of hardly any water once every seven and a half days in the growing season and it's still there in my parents yard so it, it's going to take over an area but it's so good it's kind of got this like sharper kind of cinnamony smell to it oh it's so good um but the fresh flavor is completely different from the dried so this is kind of a fun one to grow because you can you know a dish might call for dried and you can put fresh in and you're not going to ruin the dish, but it will have a, a little bit more of a depth of flavor to it. So it's really good, easily grown from seeds or transplant. I don't know what's wrong with this, the seeds this year, but everywhere I've been, places are running out of seeds. So I couldn't find any when I went to go buy uh, herbs for the class. No, you know, these are definitely going straight into my garden that I'm going to be in um, on Saturday. But really easy and Greek. Um, it means joy of the mountains. So that's kind of just a fun thing, right? Kind of a joyous little herb, joy of the mountains. Lots of fun things. So dill, dill is another one that I'm going to be growing from seeds because it grows so easily from seed and grows best from seed because it does have a little bit of a tap root that's hard to transplant. So it's an annual. Um, this is another one that it's just going to seed when, when it's ready to. When the plant is biologically ready to seed, it's just going to send them up. So if you are growing dill for, the, um, for the, the leaves, it's another one that would really benefit from, having, from being planted every few weeks to make sure you have a fresh supply. Really popular fish, potato, and pickle dishes. Like I said, I made German potato salad, which is so good. It's kind of like a potato salad that's very herby without like the mayonnaise on it. So very good. It's a good thing to try. Um, I've got a couple of different varieties here. I didn't mean to buy both of these. <laughs> Oops. But I'm going to plant both of them because it sounds like fun. And one is a much smaller variety than the other. So one thing to note about dill is, is it does get pretty tall. So it does need a little bit of space in the garden. Um, I don't know. It's just a really good one. You can use the leaves to flavor dishes, but then you can also, when the seed heads hit, um, wait and, and harvest those seeds. And then you can use those seeds in dishes as well. It's a good one. It's also a very, very easy one to grow. Um, a little interesting tidbit from it. its history is that as early as 400 BC, they found the remnants in Neolithic settlements. So, you know, it's another really old herb that's kind of cool kind of cool to grow. Um, sage is a fun one. Sage is another one that has 1.5 billion different types. <laughs> well, that's how it feels. That's an exaggeration. But this is the flavor that you're thinking of when you think of Thanksgiving stuffing. That really herby kind of like lower no when it comes to flavor. Um, Mm, sorry, I'm like sitting here smelling my herbs, but um, this is best grown from transplant because the seeds just take so darn long to, to grow, to give you a big enough plant that you can start harvesting off of. Um, um, pineapple sage is, is kind of a fun one that you can use and people will take the pineapple sage and it grows really lanky, right? So pineapple sage, most sages kind of grow in like a nice mound like over time, this, it, it, it likes it hot. This is another one you could put in a dry spot in your yard, um, but it'll grow nice and, and mounding. But the pineapple sage grows like, you know, like it's like kind of lanky. I don't know what other word to use, but sometimes people will let it go and then it's kind of a woody plant. And so they'll take the, the, the long pineapple sage, take the leaves off and then use the sticks as skewers. And then you're kind of getting that pineapple-y, sagey flavor into whatever you're cooking on the barbecue. So that's kind of fun. Um, another thing about sage is that the flavor really changes when you cook it and when you fry it. So it's often used, like you can get a, a pot of hot oil or not a pot. It could just be a pan, heat up some oil, fry the sage until it's crispy, and then you can use it as a garnish. And it's, it's very good. 
I, I really like sages and sages are kind of fun too, because, um, they're perennial, which is, is always great, but they have so many different colored leaves that don't necessarily impact the flavor. So if you like sage, but it is kind of a boring plant. I mean, like, it's just, this is, this is what it is, but they have yellow ones. They have purple ones. They have tri-color sage, um, very interesting different colors without altering the flavor at all. So then we have some tarragons. I think I bought a tarragon plant. I guess I didn't. So this one, um, is a little less known, I think, from the very common ones that we have here, or the ones that we, I think that we use more often than not. But it is a tender perennial, and it's hardy to negative 10. So it probably is not gonna do very good in our area. Our winters are a little cooler than that. Um, but it's really good because it has a really mild, sweet anise flavor. Um, which anise is, is like black licorice, which some people don't like. But this, the tarragon, it's such a mild, flavor that it actually works really well in a lot of dishes. Um, and I'm going to tell you all about that in one second after we talk about propagating. So really we only want to propagate by cuttings because anise randomly never flowers and when it does flower it doesn't set seed. So anise seeds are actually really rare. They're different from like the star anise I don't know if you guys are like familiar with that Asian cooking. They sometimes use it. Um, so I don't know. You're not going to see seeds very often for anise. And then so, and it's, you know, they grow so fast. Just buy a transplant and enjoy it. Um, something kind of interesting that the name is French and it means little dragon. Um, and it's one of the most popular French herbs highly used in French cuisine. So important, in fact, that Food Network, um, it was one of Food Network's Herb of the Month in 2011. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you why for my handy dandy book here. It says, it certainly does have an element of anise flavor, but the accompanying sweetness will make even the most devout licorice hater swoon. So if you're gonna take their word for it, maybe a, putting French tarragon in your garden and trying it in a dish could, I don't know, it could be your next favorite thing. So maybe give it a try and see what happens. So bay, um, a lot of people don't know this, but bay is actually a laurel tree or bush, depends on really how you grow it. Um, all the other laurel plants are considered toxic, they're poisonous, so don't eat it. But the, but the bay plant, this laurus nobilis, is, is great. It's one of our most common herbs that we use stewing in stews and soups. Um, very mild flavor once again. It kind of reminds me of thyme. Um, I, I really, really like it. Um, but you are not going to want to grow from seed because as you can see from the slide, seeds take up to six months to even just germinate. Whew. And they're not hardy to our area. So it's a tender tree. It's going to die as soon as winter hits. You can bring it in. It does have an issue, though, with drying out quickly in the wintertime. So it's hard to keep alive anyways. I buy it every year, though. I spend like $6 at Willard Bay Gardens, and I get my bay plant. And really, the, the dried leaves taste almost exactly like the fresh leaves, but the fresh leaves are stronger. So that's kind of fun. And, you know, it's it's a bay plant. Like who doesn't want that in their herb garden? Um, so yeah, you should go and get yourself one. Um, lavender, lavender is a lot of fun. It's a perennial, another low water, low fertilizer, low maintenance, except for you do have to deadhead it. But if you're growing lavender as an herb and not just as a pretty perennial, you're probably growing it for the flowers anyways, which means you're going to be cutting them off anyways, right? Um, you really only propagate these by cuttings once in a while. I just found aphids on my rose or on my lavender plant that's brand new. Oh, that makes me mad. That's okay though. So propagate by cutting. Um, sometimes like in our yards, they will, if you let the flower heads just stay on the plant over time, they do kind of reseed themselves. Um, but they just take so long to grow from seed. Um, that for the most part, you're gonna just transplant them. So some interesting things, you know, usually it's grown for its its scent, 
comes from the Latin verb. The name comes from the Latin verb to wash, very common in cosmetic products, um, but can be used in culinary dishes. Like I once had rose or sorry, <laughs> rosemary, lavender shortbread cookies. And I was shocked at how much I like them. Just a little bit of a floral note without being overbearing. So that's kind of a fun one to try as well. I'm going to put this over here away from the rest of my plants because don't want to infect them with aphids. Um, but lavender is a really popular one, very popular, lots of different varieties. But when it comes to the variety, most of what you're there bread for is size. It's not, there's not going to be a huge difference in flavor between one variety to the next. So if you have an area of your yard that you're looking for a large shrubby perennial, and this does grow more as a shrub, I guess, than a perennial. It's very woody. Um, like you can find a variety that's big. And once again, it's, it's not going to affect the flavor. Or if you have a small area, you can find ones that'll look great in a pot because they're small enough. And what that's not going to affect the flavor. You can use them just the same. If, if a recipe says lavender, you can say, oh, I can, you know, this Munstead is just as good as this hide coat. So it doesn't even matter. So marjoram is kind of a fun little plant. I feel like I'm clipping along. We're running out of time. <laughs> so, but marjoram is kind of fun. It's an annual. It's related to oregano. Basically, the same, but much milder and a little bit sweeter. So this is a great um, if option if you're like, I like oregano, Janice, but I just really don't have place for it except for plant it in the ground somewhere. And I just said, don't put it in the ground. You're going to have it years later. Um, this could be a, a different, another option. But because it is such a tender flavor, you add it to the end of a dish rather than the beginning of a dish. Um, something interesting about this plant is that it the the flavors develop as the season goes on so this little plant is going to grow and i am i'm going to probably use it once in a while um i don't use marjoram a ton but once it starts to set seed i'm going to take it and i'm going to cut it way back almost to the ground that's going to encourage more growth it's going to put on a second flush and the second flush is going to be stronger flavored and kind of a, a, a different flavor than the first flush. That's more tasty. So kind of interesting. Marjoram's a fun one. Grow it and try it out. And it could be your new favorite. Oh yeah, so this is kind of fun. Ancient Greeks used it in funeral wreaths to symbolize happy ha happiness. I apologize, that's bad spelling. In the next life. So um, kind of interesting. Little chamomile. I don't have a, a plant to show you because... I don't really like it. Um, it's a hardy annual, so it can grow um, from seed, and you can plant the seeds as soon as the ground is workable. So plant it out with your peas if you want. Um, maybe not the peas. Peas can handle lots of cold. Chamomile can handle some cold. Um, but it's grown for the flowers, so you can cut them off and dry them in a dehydrator or just on a, a sheet. Um, dry them nice and flat so they look really pretty floating around in your tea and then you can use them to make teas that promote relaxation. So if you're feeling anxious right now because you're in quarantine and haven't been able to get out and about, maybe some chamomile tea would help. Um, but, the, but this plant really doesn't like to be dry at all. So it likes to be kept evenly moist. Um, and then this is one where like rich soil results in poor flower production. So that's kind of interesting. So if you are wanting to grow this, you want some chamomile tea, you're going to want a lot of flowers, grow it in some batter, batter, whoa, that was bad English, grow it in some less desirable soil. So and really, if you think about it biologically, that makes sense because sometimes when plants are under stress, you know, something goes off in their head and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm about to die. I, I have to propagate myself quick progenitors. Like, you know, here we go. And so um, they're going to set more flowers because something in their little biology says, oh, I'm kind of stressed. This might be the end for me. I, I better, I better put some flowers out there, you know? So that's kind of an interesting tidbit. That's what orchids do which this is kind of an interesting fact that I'm like, we're running out of time. So let me just talk about orchids for a minute. Um, sometimes they put on what's called a pipe or pipe, a pup, 
you know, along the stem. And some people are like, oh, my orchid is having a baby. That usually means that the, the mother orchid is really stressed for some reason. And she's trying to propagate herself. So she's going to put a pup out. And, and that's kind of the same principle as what's happening with the chamomile. So an interesting little plant. Um, lemongrass is so good. Once again, if you're into Asian cooking, you need a lemongrass and a Thai basil and you will be set. So this is a, a tender perennial and they do grow pretty big. So I'm going to plant this little guy in my garden and by the end of the, the season, it's going to be quite tall. Um, so it's something that's kind of fun about it is that it's a fantastic mosquito repellent. Um, so some people, even if they opt not to use them in for like cooking they'll just put them like in the middle of a pot you know how sometimes you see like in a if I have a flower pot and I'm planting flowers some people will put like a, a spike in the middle sometimes people will put these in instead and then it's used as a mosquito repellent so like I said it's it's common in Asian dishes um something kind of fun so you can buy a starter plant like this from a nursery or if your grocery store carries fresh lemongrass stock stalks you can sometimes use the top of it and then put the end in some water and then it'll grow another plant for just from the stock so that's kind of cool this is one that does want a lot of fertilizer it will grow much better if you can give it some nitrogen periodically throughout the season um, when it comes to cooking it so it has little tiny baby stalks but those stalks are going to um really mature and get really thick and so you can chop them and you dry the outer stalks like you and then use it like you would a bay leaf they're too dense to eat like well sometimes in asian cuisine you'll you'll see it powdered and they'll add it to dishes in a powdered form um but the actual stock itself it's too fibrous you really it's ugh, it's kind of it, it's distracting from the dish when all of a sudden you hit something that you can't chew so you would use it like a bay leaf, stew it, and then take it out. But then the inner portion of the stock can be chopped up and, and used as more of like a, a more tender plant to, to, to flavor your dish. So um, that's kind of fun though. Lemongrass is always good. So the next two are ginger and turmeric. And like I said, this is mostly in here because this is my big goal for this year is I'm going to successfully grow some ginger and some turmeric. Um, ginger though is pretty inexpensive. So, and it's kind of a lot of work. So it's one of those that maybe it's not worth it. Depends on how much you use it. Um, but both ginger and turmeric, they're tender rhizomes. Um, and they must have excellent drainage. Any type of plant where you're focused on, a a rhizominous root or a really fleshy root is not going to handle any type of ex excess moisture, but it still wants to stay moist. So you're like, huh, a little bit finicky, but kind of fun. So you can grow ginger and turmeric from fresh ginger and turmeric found at your supermarket. Um, fresh turmeric is kind of hard to find, but fresh ginger is pretty easy to find. And so you're gonna cut the rhizomes into one inch pieces, and then you have to allow them to heal for a couple of days. So when you cut them, you're gonna smell the most amazing smell. Ginger, fresh ginger is one of my favorite foods of all time. And it's gonna have wet ends where you just made the cut. You're gonna allow them to sit for a few days and it's gonna kind of scab over. It's gonna just heal over to where it's dry. And, and then when you plant them, they're not just gonna mold and, and die. Um, then you're going to allow them to grow for as long of a period as possible. So these guys are a little finicky because it has to be warm for them to germinate, to start growing from those, those, um, one inch pieces. Um, but then they have to have a long, a pretty long growing, warm growing season. So there's a picture of a, of a ginger flower of uh, the bottom picture is a ginger flower. You're not, you're not going to see that here. They're really pretty, but for the most part, you're not going to see them because the season will end before they have a chance to put those on. Um, and so ginger, there's young ginger and there's mature ginger and our season is too short. We're not going to get the mature ginger. So the top picture on the slide is a picture of mature, mature ginger. It has a brown um, kind of skin on it, I guess. And that we would need four months of additional growing season for our ginger to hit that um, state. So you, you will see like at farmer's market, 
uh, ginger grown, but a lot of the times it's more of a creamy color with a thin skin and that does not last very long. So this is ginger that once it's harvested, you're gonna put it in your fridge, you're gonna use it quickly or you're gonna dry it. So kind of fun. And so the, here's turmeric, it's literally grown almost the exact same way. We're not gonna get mature turmeric, just like we're not gonna get mature ginger. Um, both are best started if you can if you can start growing them well before growing like the growing season so at least six weeks before start growing them inside um, hardening off is very important but that's kind of important for all plants right like all of my little herbs here all my little babies they haven't been really hardened off to be outside yet they've been growing happily in, in a nice warm greenhouse and so i'm going to give them a couple days outside before i put them in the soil so we don't want to shock them too much, just a little bit of shock at a time to kind of get them ready to be outside. Um, also, I just realized that bottom picture is not turmeric. I don't know what happened to my picture of a turmeric flower, although it looks almost exactly the same as a ginger flower because they're so closely related. So you're gonna harvest them right before the last frost happens. Um, but fresh ginger and fresh turmeric is so much better than the powdered stuff you buy in a little jar. So, you know, it, it, I'm excited to try it. I don't have really any personal experience with it, but next year, if I teach this class, you better believe I'm going to have some personal experience. Um, some little kind of interesting things about turmeric is, so India is the, is the biggest producer of turmeric, and it's used to dye Buddhist monk robe, which, you know, Buddhism is, Hinduism is India's main religion, but um, Southeast Asia, they grow a lot of turmeric, and it's used to, to dye the, that kind of really deep golden color that the monks of the monks robes. So that's kind of interesting. And then there's a lot of health benefits touted about turmeric and it's the curcumin properties that are great for health. It's that bright yellow color. So that's kind of a fun one. And here's our last slide. We're ending with saffron because it's so interesting, so easy to grow, but so hard <laughs> to harvest. And so um, I don't know if my, I might move myself over here. There we go. So um, saffron is the world's most expensive spice. And it, it is expensive. It can, it costs a lot of money per ounce. Um, and that's because it is grown on these little um, crocus bulbs that look just like the crocus that we saw at the end of February, 1st of March. Um, and you can see those dark reddish orange stigma. So that's the, the, the pollen that, you know, the plant's little male parts that they're putting out there. Yeah, I just, <laughs> I all of a sudden was second guessing myself, but yeah, so it's, it's the stigma that the plant's putting out there for pollination purposes. Um, and so to harvest these, you have to harvest them by hand. And usually you're out there with tweezers, but saffron is such a tasty herb that I don't know. I, I buy it. I'm one of those people. <laughs> I buy quite a bit of it actually because I cook with it quite often. Um, but you can grow your own right here. So this is kind of an interesting plant because you're going to plant the bulb in the fall, which is when you would plant all of your spring, all of your spring blooming bulbs, right? Um, you're going to plant it in the fall. It's going to send its leaves up in the springtime, but then it's not going to set flower until the next fall. It's going to come up, set its flower. You're going to get all the little stigmas. You're going to be out there on your hands and knees with your tweezers, um, harvesting it, and then you dry it on a sheet of paper and um, you put it in a little glass jar and you can have saffron all year round. I did not know this was possible until, I think it was last year, I was at a local nursery and I was looking through all their bulbs and I was like, saffron, like that is so weird. I knew it had grown from a crocus bulb, but it's most common, our most common suppliers are, are from Asia, right? You know, so I was like, does that really grow here? It turns out it does. You know, University of Mrs. Minnesota had, their fact sheet is where I got some of this information. Um, they're like, in Minnesota, we should grow crocus. And I was like, if in Minnesota they can grow crocus or the saffron crocus in Utah, we probably can as well. It is hardy to negative 15, which is about a zone six. So if you are in colder parts of the, um, the state, then you might have a little bit of an issue with it. Um, but 
yeah, but you do kind of need a lot, but a little bit of saffron does go a long way and the bulbs do reproduce pretty prolifically. So if you start with 10 bulbs, when you dig them up every couple of years and divide them, you're going to have many more than 10 bulbs that you can then plant out and get more saffron. Um, but this is kind of a fun little fact. So 150 bulbs are needed for one gram of dried saffron. That is why it is the most expensive herb or spice in the world. But it's kind of fun. So if as a hobby gardener, this is something that you're interested in, you can find these bulbs offline. I found them at J&J's just here in um, Layton a couple last year, I guess. So they're out there and you can try. I mean, if you're interested, definitely give them a shot. Um, one thing I did kind of want to say is, so when you're looking up information about different herbs and spices or gardening in general, um, just make sure that you're looking at good resources. So whenever I go in to search anything, you know, I, I'll usually will be like, okay, what do I already know about this plant? Start writing stuff down and then to fact check myself as well as to answer some of the questions I have, I always type in like saffron, extension and then what pulls up are extensions from state universities from around the country and from their experiences research they've done and then i can i can feel pretty good about um the information that i'm getting another good place if you can't find a lot of information from universities or nonprofit organizations um seed catalogs are often a little more reliable um, bloggers are okay if they're reputable, but a lot, you just don't know. You don't know where the information is coming from. So there's a lot of fun different herbs to try. There are so many varieties, so many different types, um, lots of fun things to, to, to try in your garden this year. So that's all I have. So Dave, do we have any questions? Thanks, Janice. <clears throat> we do have questions. So let me just go over a few of these. You, hopefully you'll answer them. Um, I wanted to mention there's a couple people that had raised their hand and I don't know if we got their questions. If they can go into the Q&A box and ask those questions, we'll get to them because we're not, we, there's no way to have you raise your hand and, and talk through. So uh, if you raise your hand, get on the Q&A and ask the questions. So here's a couple of them. Um, okay. One that came in was, you discussed bolting just a little bit. Um, yeah. The question was, how do, you, how do you keep some of these from bolting in the heat? you don't <laughs> that sounds like such a like a a hard thing but bolting is just kind of a natural process that the the plants go through um with with like um coriander cilantro one thing you can do because it likes to have a little cooler you can try putting it somewhere where it's going to get morning sun and then afternoon shade but then you're not going to get that good flavor developing um yeah, so you can try to plant success, succession planting, like I said. Um, so plant it and then two weeks later plant some more and two weeks later plant some more and then you'll have um, dill or um, basil, or not basil, sorry. Um, coriander for, or sorry, cilantro. That's the word I'm thinking of. You're gonna have cilantro for a longer period of time. But once it gets hot, it's just, it's just what it wants to do. So you, there's just really not much to do about it. Okay, next question. <clears throat> um, if you could talk just a little bit about harvesting mint for tea and drinks. Okay, yeah, so harvesting, I'm assuming you're talking about like you wanna dry it and then you're gonna steep it in water later. So when you, when you harvest mint, um, it's basically how you would harvest any other leafy herb. So in the morning is best, when right after the um the dew has dried so you're just gonna and mint is so aggressive you can take a lot off of the plant even though it is a perennial you can take more than half the plant off and it is gonna do just fine so you're gonna take it back to the next growing point just pinch it off um a lot of sources said that it's best to wash your herbs, which that's probably true. Do I ever wash my herbs? Not really because I know what's going on them. And um, I, if I see something on them, I'll wash them, but I probably don't wash them as much as I should. So give them a rinse, pat them dry as much as you can. Um, you don't want a lot of moisture on there and then just dry it in a warm, um, dry place for, it should only take a couple of days to dry, or you can use a dehydrator 
or you can use your oven on its lowest setting to dry it really quickly. Um, if you are just steeping it fresh, you can steep it fresh in hot water and drink it as a fresh tea. Um, and then you just get your water boiling, pour it over some fresh mint leaves and, and you can eat it like that or drink it like that. I don't know if that answered the question, but it, it's basically the same as though, as if you were drying any other herb. Yeah, that, I think that probably covered it. While we're talking about mints, there was another question about um, considering planting Corsican mint as a ground cover in, yeah. the, bare, in the bare patches of your lawn. Um, would you need oh. to worry about it taking over your wanted lawn areas? Um, the question was, she's not sure how invasive it is. It's pretty invasive. Um, lawn herbs. Yeah, Corsican mint is, it's, it's going to take over. <laughs> so um, I probably wouldn't put it, if, you, if I had a large law, um, lawn area and had some dry areas or some bare areas, I probably wouldn't just fill it in with mint. It's going to, it'll take over. Yes. Yes, okay. it will. That's the short answer. Okay. Um, what, there were a couple questions about rosemary. <laughs> Um, one was the rosemary is blooming now. Should it be cut back? And the other part of the second part of that question: Are the leaves still good to dry once it starts to bloom? Yes. Yeah. So with rosemary and like most of the other perennial herbs, um, you do want if you are focusing on um, like drying the leaves, you do want to catch it before the the flowers have had a chance to really go to town. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's no flavor in those leaves. It's just going to be less flavor. Um, and and there are some depending on the variety. You'd have to do some research that you do actually want to wait until the flowers actually open, and that's when the the um the oils will be at their maximum rosemary that's not one of them you do want to try and catch it before it's had a chance to set up any type of flowers but it'll it'll you can still dry them and it'll still work did that answer that did i get all the those parts um, Dave? what about the cutting it back should she cut it back right now oh yeah yeah go ahead okay um another question um any way to encourage larger roots on on herbs like horseradish? Um, yeah, actually. So um, some really um, fibrous, not, why do I keep saying fibrous, really fleshy roots like that, they will do better if you can let them have a little bit of cold at the end of the year. And if you, well, maybe not cold, you don't want them to freeze at all, but you, you do want them to have a little bit of a, of a chill to kind of, that's when they're going to be like, oh, it's time, you know, for me to start pulling all of those um, nutrients down into my, into my rhizome or into my roots, which that's, it's just a little storage room for the plants. That's where it's pulling all of the, the nutrients. And then we're going to take those and we're going to eat it. Um, but if you can give it a little bit of stress from drought at the end of its growing season, that's going to also encourage it to start developing those rhizomes and you're going to have more because you've let it stress a little bit. So at, around the, when it starts to get cold, cut back on the watering and let it dry out a little bit more between waterings. Hey, that's good. A couple questions about chives and those that are, those that are putting questions in right now, just be patient. We'll get to all of these. Um, garlic chives are in a pot. Um, she wants to put those out into a, a regular herb bed. Should she leave them in the pot? or just put them in the bed? Not sure how aggressive they will be for spreading. So garlic chives, I have never grown myself. Um, are they, I don't know if they're just a garlicky flavored chive or if they're a completely different plant because there are some garlics, types of garlic that you, that are very aggressive that, you know, it's, they're going to go everywhere. We planted some in our learning garden and they're just everywhere in our edible section now. And, but the actual chive, if it's just a garlic flavored chive, it's, it'll act just like a regular chive. And they're, they're so good in the, in just your perennial garden. They're not going to take over and they're kind of a nice little wispy texture. That's going to add some interest to your garden. Okay. I think, yeah, you probably answered that. She says, yes, they're regular chives, oh, okay. just a garlic flavored. So yeah, think you, they'll you, be fine. you address that. They're going to be fine. Another, another question about chives while we're there. Um, the question is, my chives are already sending up blooms. Should I cut off these blooms to keep the chives producing longer? 
Um, chives will produce whether they're blooming or not. So you don't really need to worry that much about it. Um, they're, well, they're fine. You, you can cut them off to kind of help encourage more rooting and, and more of the leafy growth. But for the most part, um, chives are such good little growers that it's not like if you let it go to seed, you're going to see a like big reduction in the amount of leaves that are being produced. So if you like the look of them, maybe let the, the flowers go for a little bit. They are really cute. I really like them. Okay, that's good. A um, couple questions, a couple more, and then we'll wrap up. But um, is there a kind of deal other than mammoth deal that grows well outside in our climate? Yeah, so I told you I accidentally bought two packets of dill. Haste makes waste, right? Um, so this one that I'm that I, I actually read the back of the package and I was like, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. Is it's called Duke It Leafy Dill, um, sweet mellow dill bred in Denmark for traditional Scandinavian dishes. It's a little bit different because it's a little milder and a little bit sweeter and a little bit smaller. So that's kind of fun. Um, so Utah State University has really good fact sheets on a couple of different herbs. They don't have a huge resource for herbs right now, um, but if you go to their regular garden website, garden.usu.edu, there's a vegetable fruit and herb section. If you click on that, um, there's some fact sheets and I'm pretty sure they have a dill one and it'll go, it has ones that do well in our area. But because it is an annual anyways, it kind of doesn't matter. Like most of them should do okay because it, you're not worried about um, whether it's going to survive the winter or not. Um, if you are looking for lots of seed, you can try and find a package where there are less days to maturity, but for the most part, like any of them should do good. Just try them out and have fun. They're easy to grow. Okay, a couple more. Um, is there a way to know what, there, you know, the best way to know which herbs you should be putting together? Um, so when, you're first getting into cooking with a lot of herbs. I think the best thing to do is follow recipes. <laughs> so, and that kind of like gives you an idea of, of what things taste like. And then you can kind of like picture in your head as you're cooking, you're like, okay, like I just put, you know, this is a very heavy basil dish. Like what could I add with it? I don't know, maybe something that's a little citrusy or something with a little bit of an onion over note to it. Um, so I think the best thing to do when you're first trying to figure out like, how how do these herbs actually taste is finding a recipe where it is the herb is the star of the dish and it's the only herb in the dish like um rosemary potatoes potatoes are very mild like there's not much flavor to a potato but when you add rosemary all of a sudden they're very flavorful and then you have a good idea of what rosemary tastes like right and then when you're trying to think like oh i'm roasting something what herbs do i want well i i know i like rosemary so let's roast our, I don't know, does that make sense? Like, I guess maybe the answer, the short answer is just to experiment. There's really no other way. Sometimes you can like kind of create flavor profiles like um, Latin American dishes, like Mexican dishes. They, there are a certain kind of set of herbs that they use a lot. Um, you know, French, they have kind of their dozen that they use all the time. Indian, Thai, they all kind of have like their set. So if you're kind of staying within um, like a flavor profile from a different part of the world, different types of cuisine, that can also be a good way to, to mix and match herbs. I don't know, that answered that question. <laughs> it might have in, in the sense of cooking, now maybe in the sense of what you're putting oh. together in the beds. Oh, planting. Okay. So I'm not sure, but you could address that too. Okay. Yeah. So planting. So when it comes to really aggressive herbs, like your mints and your oreganos, I plant these guys in their own pot because they are just going to take over the pot. Sometimes I'll plant like a bunch of different types of mints together just for fun. You know, they're all going to be aggressive. It's like a, it's like a bloodbath. We're going to see who, you know, is dominant, but, um, for the most part, very aggressive herbs that are going to take over, get their own pot. So sometimes they get smaller pots, um, just little happy herbs that are, that aren't going to take over. It's just kind of like any other container or any other flower bed that you're doing tall ones to the back, make sure everything has enough room around it for air circulation. That's going to help minimize disease and pests. Um, for the most part, there's not really like an herb that I can think of that if you planted it with another herb, it's going to do bad. 
you know, and I can't really think of any either where if you plant them together, they're going to benefit one another. So I, I think it's just kind of the way that you would design any flower bed is probably how you would design your perennial bed as well. Great. Um, another question about saffron. You harvest stigmas in the fall. Is this different than the crocus that only bloom in the spring? Yeah, it is a different different crocus. So for the most part, the crocuses that we have here that bloom in the spring, they're, they're not the same variety. They're all crocus, but they're not the same um, species. They're the same genus. So most of them, if you look closely, they don't have this, this red orange stigma coming off of them. Most of them, you'll just see the little yellow stamens. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe you could if there is a stigma there, you could try it, but it, it's not the same saffron, no. So I wouldn't go through the trouble of trying to harvest your regular crocus when it's so labor intensive. Just buy the right saffron crocus to begin with and it, you'll for sure be successful. Great. And then one more. Have you used a freeze dryer in preserving your herbs? Any thoughts about doing that? I have not, but I have been wanting to get a freeze dryer so I can freeze dry berries and powder them and put them in um breads which i think it sounds very good i've seen a lot of recipes but no i i, I imagine that freeze drying um would do about the same as drying wood just quicker and probably a little bit better yeah it might it might preserve the flavors or something a little different yeah because yeah it so it does it so quickly yeah yeah and that's like, the point is you, is you want to dry herbs as fast as possible with the lowest amount of heat. <laughs> so freeze drying would probably accomplish that really well. But yeah. I've never used it. I have no experience. There's one last question that just kind of popped in. It, um, it says, I know you mentioned keeping herbs moist, but not wet. Uh, but do you have a general watering frequency suggestion for an herb box in, a, in the latent area? So it's kind of hard to say because it will highly depend on the time of year. And um, so what you do is you just, you got to watch the soil. Like that's, there's really no other good way to, um, to, to do it. You know, like when I grow my stuff in containers, I just, you just kind of got to watch it. And I know that in August, I'm going to have to water much more frequently than in May. So it, it's really kind of hard to say. And it also depends, like it's highly dependent on the type of, soil that you have or the type of media that you have in the grow box. So I know that that's like a, a long way of saying just you're going to have to watch it and kind of figure it out. Um, but once the surface of the soil is looking dry, that it's probably time to, to water again. Um, if the, the surface of the soil in one inch down is, is pretty dry, chances are that it's getting to a point where it's, you, there still might be a little bit of moisture down there, but that moisture is going to quickly dissipate. So watch it when the surface is, is, is dry, go ahead and water it and you'll kind of get it uh, like it figured out. You'll get in a rhythm, but no, I don't have any like specific recommendations. Yeah. I'll just add to that. Um, that anytime you have a raised bed, it is, it is going to take more water or you're going to have to do that more frequently because it's above ground. It's, it'll simply dry out much quicker. So you, you may, again, Janice is right on, the soil type, whatever media you have in there. Midsummer, you may end up watering those beds every single day. Yeah. I think that's all the questions, Janice. Well done. Well, great. So, um, let me add to, to those that are just still with us. We had a lot with us. Uh, perennials is next week at the same time. And then we're going to be coming up with a schedule for the month of May where we'll look at different topics and possibly some different times. Um, but there's, there's things that are coming because we're not able to meet as far as we know yet. We're still not able to hold in-person classes, so we'll continue to look for options to do these online classes. If you're still with us on Facebook, um, we, we had some issues with the capping through Zoom. We're going to look at some options for increasing that or we'll, we'll get word out much sooner about how to, how to live stream this either through YouTube or Facebook for the classes to come. So with that, I think that's it. Awesome, thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us and we'll hopefully see you again next week.